Hi, Lucinda. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Jane. It's great to be here at last. I'm so excited to talk to you about all things children's health. How I was reading on your bio on your website that you do, you're a naturopath, you're an iridologist, a herbalist, mm-hmm. and a functional medicine practitioner. So you've covered quite a lot of ground. Well, yeah, no, I mean, I started off basically, this is a long time ago. This is before, you know, the internet existed or, you know, so there was a, I was basically, I, I was working in the city. I got really run down. I spent my life fast asleep in the loo or having tummy cramps or not getting my period or whatever. I had a million things going on Mm. and uh, the doctor said I was fine. And I thought, well, I'm not fine. I know I'm not. So it's an naturopath. And uh, she was based in Chiswick. She was absolutely lovely. And within 10 days of changing my diet a bit and taking some herbal pills and some vitamins and things, I felt amazing. Absolutely amazing. Wow. In just 10 days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was so quick. I mean, I was only 25. So you have a pretty adaptable body then. And yeah, and I basically thought, this is what I want to do. Um, So I, at the follow up, instead of saying, you know, let's go through, I said, I'm feeling amazing. Where do I learn? And she gave me two numbers um, and one didn't answer. And the other one, yes, said, yes, please do come along next weekend. So I thought, well, you know, that was my research because remember that it was really hard to do research in those days. So I went along and they were training in naturopathy, iridology and herbs. So that was sort of the baseline. And I did that for quite a long time. And I saw a lot of women. I did a lot of fertility work. I did a lot of women's hormone work, etc. And then I had two babies and I realized that there was almost nothing going on when it was to do with children's nutrition. It was very much based on before you have the baby, but maybe even whilst you're pregnant. But then afterwards, there was nothing. Um, So um, and we had some ups and downs with our children's health. So I got really interested in in sort of I'm a bit of a detective and I like to find out what's going on. So we, we did a lot of sort of unraveling of their health issues and um, got them pretty much sorted which is really exciting um so those are sort of the original things that I did and then when I was pregnant with my third baby I decided that I really wanted to take my clinic to another level and so that's where I did the functional medicine university which was amazing and that just transformed my practice you know so now our practice my my practice because I've got quite a team now I've got lots of nutritional therapists dotted around the country but so we basically focus in on what we call evidence-based nutrition where we will um, first of all um, understand what might be driving a condition so we'll look into all the research behind those conditions but secondly we will do testing lab testing um, to find out why that might be happening and to assess exactly what the person needs so that's really where it merged into uh, about 13 years ago Wow. And I I was going to ask you actually how, when you started and I didn't realize you decided to just completely up level whilst you were pregnant. Yes. Cause I'm nuts like that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it, yeah, it was because we were having quite a lot of concerns about our eldest child by then who was five, five or six. And so I'd sort of been looking at how to help him. And I realized that functional medicine was the way forward because then we don't understand exactly what he needed. Because you can read these books, but I mean, he, his sort of presentation at the time was dyspraxia, ADD. Um, and so I read all these books. And of course, you just sit there going, well, I can't give him 60 supplements and change his diet to X, Y, and Z. It's just not going to happen. So I need a more focused approach. So I thought, well, if I do those tests, then I get to understand what he really, really needs. And actually, what was amazing was his nutrition was pretty good. It's just he had a couple of gut bugs. Um, he had a couple of toxins we had to clear. And literally within two, three weeks of doing this, he, he turned around one morning and said, Mummy, my brain's not playing hide and seek anymore. I can concentrate. Oh my gosh. Do you know what that makes? I'm so, I've been so emotional since I've had my son, but just hearing that, <laughs> I just feel like I'm trying not to cry. That's, that's huge. Children are amazing with, you know, things they say as well. Wow. Absolutely. So basically he said, it's like my brain is a game of hide and seek. And I've got to find five boys before my brain is like the others. Oh my gosh. It was so sweet. And then basically, you know, like he said, I can see where I'm one around the corner. And then he goes, found him. And over the next sort of 18 months, 
he basically he said well I've got one left but so have the other boys is that all right mum <laughs> oh my goodness that's that's so, unbelievable yeah he was amazing he's absolutely amazing he's now 20 years old he's at a really good university doing fantastically well lots of friends and he's just a lovely young man so all those concerns that he had because it wasn't just his learning, it was his mental health, it was his friendships, it was all of those things, you know, that was so important. Because of course, once you get labelled with something and you're struggling with things at school, it's so, so hard. Um, and you feel a bit isolated yourself. And as a parent, you feel isolated too, because a lot of people don't understand your child. Mm. Um, but yeah, it took a lot of time, but he's a great young man now. And we're very proud of him for everything that he's done for himself too. Oh, that's absolutely such a lovely story. <laughs> I mean, you must, you must feel just amazed by what you've also been able to achieve by just supporting him with dietary changes and finding out what's, what's gone on. Well, I think what really inspired me was that um, I was looking after a couple of kids with autism at the time. And I realized that there was a lot and it was to do and it was really complex. And so there was a conference um, by a, an amazing charity um, happening so I thought I'll go along for them and if there's anything I can learn for my son that would be great you know I knew he wasn't autistic but I just thought I'm going to go along and I'm sure this might help me too with my journey with my son and I went along and I had these incredible incredible doctors from all the way around the world mainly America they come over to the UK for this and the parents there had kids who were severely autistic you know all these serious serious neurological issues and developmental issues going on and they were there changing their diet putting in the vitamins doing it and I thought wow and they were seeing such amazing changes and some of the stories I saw you know um over that weekend and chatting to other parents and what they were doing I thought god if they can do that for their children I can do that for mine so it was inspired by other parents and amazing doctors wow and what I mean if you if you were into health before that, this is what I'm always wondering. If you're in good nutritional state, what is it that can trigger these gut bugs and the toxic issues and things that we're seeing so much today in children? In fact, there's sort of two questions. <laughs> Why is there such a rise in these things happening firstly? But also what's the on the other side of it, if you are already healthy and you have a healthy pregnancy, what can trigger these issues alongside that as well? Does that make sense? I'm going to get back to front. I'm going to answer your second question first, because um, I, you know, I've been trying to wrap my brains why this happened to us, considering I was, you know, I'd been doing all of this for quite a few years before, you know, during pregnancy, I was really careful with what I ate, etc. Now, first of all, I was very stressed during pregnancy. Um, I basically moved countries, moved jobs, moved home, moved everything. We had every change under the sun going on. So that was huge. Um, so, and I guess the beginning of motherhood was slightly speedier than we ever expected. So it was kind of, again, we weren't probably quite ready in some ways. Yes, in lots of ways. We were like, wow, this is so exciting, but also, ah, petrifying. You know? <laughs> um, lots of things going on. Um, I was... I found it really hard first time around as mum and I was desperate to get back to work and you know you see all these amazing day nurseries being advertised and so forth and there was one just around the corner from where we lived and it just sounded a really great way of doing things because nannies are super expensive etc we had a tiny flat we couldn't have no pair you know we was trying to work out what to do and um so he went there and literally he was sick every single week he was there Oh um, and it was it was not it wasn't colds and fevers so much it was just awful runny tummies I remember picking him up one day out of his bouncer and because I could and he basically just had poo all out the bouncer and I remember going drip 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 oh. all the way there. it was so awful <laughs> you know I mean he had these explode and they all started then and anyway later on down the line when we did do the stool testing we found an amoeba in his gut called defragilis which is quite common but it's very common in day nurseries and it can cause a sort of IBS thing. And it also, we see it a lot in the kids with learning difficulties and so forth. So I suspect, because he was so robust before then, um, that that was one trigger. 
Um, and then the second thing was that we moved house. We moved out of London to where we are now in Wiltshire. And the first thing, it's a lovely old house. The first thing we decided to do was we decorate. Of course, that puts a lot of dust and things into the atmosphere. And, you know, he's little and, you know, sort of running around and crawling around or whatever. Um, and I, we found a whole load of lead in his hair. Um, and I think what had happened was he must have ingested some lead when we were renovating the house because we in our previous house it, I just can't imagine it was it was really quite modern the flat so you know or, or we'd recently done it up so I just suspect it must have happened there but anyway that was a that was a real surprise and it's sort of like oh wow it was literally like the test was zoom right well, you know right right over to sort of France as such it was just there was so much on the chart wow. so anyway and, and it was in his blood and it was too you know even and yeah you know, anyway so we had a couple of real surprises but looking back, I suspect that those are the two things that came together because lead reduces the IQ. Um, it can, you know, it can really, really impact on the child's brain development. So luckily, we caught it relatively early from being exposed. Um, mm. So I think that's why we were able to reverse things relatively quickly. That's so maybe interesting. Maybe these things you just don't know about until you become a parent. You don't, you go, yeah, 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 lead. Oh, yeah, that's, an, you know. You, know, you just don't think about it, do you? No. And I know I'm sure a lot of mums will be listening and going, oh my gosh, what happens if this is with my child? What, what are the steps then that you can do generally, whether you get testing or, or even if you've just got general concerns about your child's health, how do you support their gut and their immune system and their brain health? So it's really going down to those really basic building blocks, you know, those, those foundations of health. So the first thing that I would advise anyone to do is to start cooking food from scratch. So to eat as much food that you have made. Now, everyone goes, oh, yeah, we do that all the time. You know, we always, but they, if you think about it, they usually, when people say that, they mean supper. They mean that evening meal. They'll cook that from scratch. Um, but actually breakfast could easily be cornflakes, skim milk, jam from a pot, um, margarine from a pot, bread from a packet. So it's all been made by someone else. It's been constructed by you <laughs> at breakfast. Yeah. Um, so that's where thinking, how am I going to make breakfast healthier? So am I going to make porridge? Am I going to do scrambled eggs? Things like that. Um, can I get some colour into there? Can I get some berries or even a little bit of cucumber or some little baby tomatoes or something even at breakfast or getting some chopped up veggies in the omelette so there are lots of different ways and um, we, we're masters at, at grating in things like carrot beetroot courgette everything Just hide things. yeah <laughs> I mean I'm not into hiding hiding but I think I'm into boosting and so you can always put the foods on the side too but I think it's important to have try and get in as much as possible so I think it's all about those the really good food the foundations foundations are just really nutritious so i'm into supercharging every single mouthful with as much nutrition as possible so you know the foods that are really nutrition dense are eggs nuts meat liver um, fish veggies um you know all those kinds of things are really really nutritious and then full fat milk proper cheese rather than anything that has been um you know sort of had the fat taken out low fat yeah. yeah exactly it's like a lot of people think that they're being really healthy when they have margarine because it says this is lower in cholesterol or whatever it is low fat and yet it's just been absolutely obliterated in factories and it's all just not very real it's you're best off to, to su such a high heat that it become to make it go from yeah, to, to bring it together into this oily mass. And um, yeah, it's not particularly good for you. And then they have to add the vitamins. And of course, those are synthetic vitamins, which our bodies aren't very good at synthesizing. So it's much better, unless your child is dairy free, um, to, to go in with good old fashioned butter. And I try and get the most yellow butter possible. So Guernsey butter or Irish butter, usually the really nice grass fed yellow butter. Mm. So there's the food. Um, and then obviously lots of hydration and trying to, and if you can possibly filter your water and to begin with, it could even just be a British filter. It doesn't need to be anything exciting. Just filter water is really good. Um, and then um, things like cleaning up your um, environment at home. So trying to go for eco washing powder and that kind of thing, trying to sort of use all your household cleaners a little bit more eco. Now you can't do it hundred percent. Of course, there's some 
icky things that need clearing up sometimes and you know but not to, you know to sort of think can i choose something a bit more natural it's less chemicals less toxic um and then can i just really interrupt you i'm so sorry yeah. just in on that point because at the moment especially with the pandemic that's going on yeah. everybody is i say everybody a lot of mums i'm seeing are detoling everything and sanitizing their kids hands and it's it's freaking me out because of the level of chemicals <laughs> but also it disrupts our gut flora sure yeah can you can you just give us a little bit of insight on on your views on that and if mums are worried about or, or dads are worried about cleaning up properly have you got any advice on that without putting toxins into the body I think right now we're at a funny stage where hopefully we are coming out of all of this, but with the Indian variant potentially coming, you know, you know, we've all sort of slightly not quite sure what's going on yet. Um, my view, and this is what we've done, is that obviously when someone goes into school or into a shop or you know somewhere or out of the shop or out of the school or whatever, yes, maybe sanitize your hands. You know, good idea. Try and get a natural one rather than the ultra chemical ones. And you know if they're natural because actually you can lick your finger and it doesn't taste horrible, you know, so that's quite an easy way of doing it. Um, but I think at home or going for a walk or something like that, you know, you really don't need to do it. And within the home, I mean, we shouldn't have had people coming in and out anyway. So really the whole dettling at home shouldn't need to be done. So within the home environment, I'd keep the, keep the windows open, try and get outside as much as possible. It's OK, you know, if things aren't spotless um, all the time. Um, and let kids get muddy. Mm, yes, that's the thing. My son is rolling around the mud in the garden, and yeah. Joel, my husband, is saying, "Wash his hands." I'm like, no, it's fine. Eat the mud. Like, go for it. <laughs> it's good for you. <laughs> there was like a study that was showing that children's immune system goes up so much when they're playing on the flo forest floor. Absolutely, it's enormous, and also playing with pets as well. Oh, so yeah. it's really interesting, actually. Um, we didn't get a puppy till my daughter was born, the second child. And her immune system and my little one's immune systems would be much stronger because they literally kind of used to live in the dog's basket, you know. Oh. <laughs> so really your take home message for all of this is that we should all get puppies. Yes, absolutely. Great. But not when you have a newborn, please. It's uh, why? Because trying to walk a puppy oh, yeah. and a baby at the same time and clearing up you know after dogs and oh it's a nightmare, it's a nightmare. So, <laughs> okay. so don't do it Noted. straight away think, you know, either get the puppy beforehand and get into it okay or think about it afterwards <laughs> noted sorry i took you off a tangent a little bit when you were talking about the things that we can do to support our health and you were talking about natural solutions that you can use in the house and then you were going to say something else and i jumped in really no all i was going to say is really optimizing sleep you know uh, um Sleep yeah. is so important and getting into a good sleep routine. Now, a lot of parents said, well, we've been trying our best. You know, we all go upstairs at half past six and then we have our bath and, you know, we put them down at half past seven and they're still up at half past ten, you know, <laughs> <laughs> or they're, you know, nipping into mum and dad's bed in the middle of the night or whatever, you know, I mean, we all try. I'm guilty, yeah. Yeah, no, we all try. But I think it's trying to find ways to really get them into that sleep pattern is is crucial. And that's what we work a lot at Nature Doc. So I am a massive fan of Epsom salt baths. For children? So, oh, absolutely. From 12 months, you can put at least a cup in the bath. Um, and with most kids, it's two cups. So it's two mugs. You put them in, And these Epsom salts are basically magnesium salts. But they're very clever because um, you've got the magnesium, which your basically your body absorbs through the skin. So it's in the water. So you don't have to give them a pill or a liquid or anything like that. So you can literally just absorb it. But it's magnesium sulfate. And the sulfate is so important for the liver. So that, again, helps the body to, to clear those toxins a little bit more efficiently than they would normally be done. Um, and, you know, I mean, there are foods that can help that, you know, things like broccoli and other cruciferous vegetables, um, you know, cauliflower, etc. And a lot of kids do eat some broccoli, but maybe not three times a day or, you know, so um, the magnesium is very relaxing. It helps with restless legs. It helps with, you know, sort of overtired children. And it's fantastic. I remember my daughter when she was little, she said, 
Mummy, I always have lovely dreams when I have an Epsom salt bar. Oh, your children just sound sweet. like the most adorable things ever. She was very sweet. <laughs> she's, now, she's now about to be 18. But um, oh. she's super, super sporty. And so if she does do an event, um, you know, a big tournament or something, she'll come home and the first thing she'll do is have an Epsom salt bath. So because it's so helpful for, you know, for muscle recovery as well. That's so interesting because I recommend it for women I work with, but I, for some reason I just assumed it would be too strong for children. So that's great no, to know. Okay, I'm going to order a giant bag. Some, some other magnesium flakes are a little bit itchy on the skin. I don't know if you've ever experienced that. Um, so um, magnesium chloride can be a little bit itchy, but um, the, the Epsom salts are not itchy at all. Okay, interesting. So it's really good for that sort of really, it's like, you know, it's like your eczema skin or, you know, just the kids that are quite sensitive. Okay, noted. And if you're trying to get all these nutritious foods and great carrot and great beetroot and really upgrade, what did you, supercharge, as you said, your kids' <laughs> meals, but they might be picky, they might be fussy, they might look at it and be like, what's that? Or, you know, pull it out. Sure. How, how do you sort of encourage fussy eaters I'm thinking of toddlers but actually you can get fussy eaters right the way through with kids that just aren't keen on even trying things what's the best way to deal with this so what what we do is we always say in the clinic what is it that your child really does like to eat so they'll often say pancakes waffles you know crunchy things crunchy beige things and that's really what we, I've done with my recipes in both my cookbooks is to develop lots and lots of beige crunchy foods that look very pretty in the book, but it, <laughs> at the end of the day, are sort of really nutritious crunchy foods. So there are lots of waffles. I think waffles are incredible. Now, if you buy a waffle in a supermarket, there are two types. You've either got the super sweet ones in the baked, baked area, or you've got the frozen potato ones. Now, both of those are basically white carb, a bit of vegetable oil and either sugar or, you know, some onion or whatever. But that's it. What mine have got is they've got chickpea flour, they've got ground almonds, they've got eggs, they've got yogurt, they've got grated carrot, they've got poppy seeds, whatever might be in there. So lots and lots of different foods. So they are crunchy. They don't look scary. Um, Everything's been grated in. So you don't get that sort of vegetable feel. Um, and they love them and we've got pesto ones and beetroot and berry ones and you know all sorts of different ones and I, I've, I did some recently on my blog um, we do a recipe every week and I you know which I, which I tend to do on a Sunday morning and then we post it on a Sunday evening um, and you know waffles are such a hit pancakes as well absolutely brilliant everyone loves a pancake now lots of these people are saying like I can't do that every day it just take too long I'd have to get up at five in the morning to do it I suggest that everyone does a massive batch at the weekend and you can freeze them. Oh, um, that's a good pancakes. Idea. Um, and we used to actually often have pancakes for Sunday breakfast and Sunday supper, but I'd sort of make it more savoury in the evening. Um, so it's amazing what, what you can do, you know, to, and, and pancakes, again, have similar ingredients to waffles. You can get all sorts in them. Um, and, you know, you can do chicken nuggets and fish fingers, but you can roll them in red lentils. Um, oh, wow. so that it, which is a really nice crust if you put it with a bit of turmeric and paprika it literally comes out bright orange like a fish finger they just don't know the difference but you know there's more nutrition in there um, oh, so there you know what? I'm sitting here just drooling listening to you <laughs> when, when can I come <laughs> round <laughs> sounds amazing oh so, yeah there's a lot I mean I love creating recipes and I and the thing about my recipes there's always a reason behind them mm. so rather than oh this is a lovely recipe that tastes nice there's always a sort of oh I developed this because so my one that went out um this week um last night was um some energy balls um but they're super super full of calcium and because I did a whole lot of information about cow's milk protein allergy and the milk ladder and so forth and I thought I'd put this in, this recipe together and it you know, had chia seeds uh, almond butter um, and oats and of course those three are super good or calcium and you know everyone's always worried about that's the biggest thing they're most worried about but they've got the yeah. other nutrition nutrients in there too so it's not just calcium there's a bit of magnesium zinc iron omega-3 etc oh it sounds amazing it sounds absolutely amazing i'm always looking at your instagram profile and just seeing these delicious recipes popping up and i've made a couple of them and they're just phenomenal and you've got a new book coming out haven't you 
I have very soon. And I'm just going to show everybody because I'm so excited about it. It's called I Can't Believe It's Baby Food. Um, and um, it's the reason it's called that is because most people think of baby food as being separate to the rest of the family. And this is basically 120 recipes that everyone can enjoy and the baby can too. So it's, it's just turning everything around so that this is food for the whole family and your baby. So it's That's all super brilliant. good for the baby too. And there's some waffles on the front there because I love waffles so much. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds absolutely amazing. I'm, it's been so great to talk to you. Not only do I just feel so excited about things that you can now grate into everything, I feel like I've got to go and make a batch of energy balls, but just hearing how you can totally transform a child's health. I, your stories have been amazing. Other than your own son and you know your daughter and everything that you've gone through, are there any stories from clinic that have, you've seen a complete turnaround in, in people's health and the kids' oh. health? Well, we've seen so many thousands of kids. Um, I, I think the most rewarding ones, and this isn't one story, but it's just the rewarding ones, are the ones where the kids have got such painful guts. So they've got terrible reflux or just tummy pains all the time. And, you know, sometimes we can resolve those within a few weeks, which is super exciting. I had a little boy who'd, yeah, recently, who'd had reflux since he was tiny and it was disrupting his day every day it disrupted his sleep he's like nine years old and he just had been you know he's a delightful young man but just distressed a lot and really worried about everything he ate in case it made things hurt and he's a totally different kid and we'd found out he had an imbalance of bacteria in his gut we rebalanced that and he's in great form absolutely flying now which is really wow. exciting so we see a lot of kids like that. Um, we see a lot of kids with anxiety, a lot of kids with OCD, a lot of kids with tics. And again, we work alongside a fantastic pediatrician with that. Um, and um, that has, we can just transform the kids' lives with that. And it's all about rebooting the immune system, which you were just mentioned earlier, which I never answered. So I'm just going to go back to that, is why do you think children's immune mm. system are so out of sync these days well there are just so many factors um it's not one thing and actually if you go onto pubmed and you do your research you'll find there are just so many different things it's basically modern living so all our food has been optimized to last on the shelf for as long as possible because we want that peach or that avocado to be perfect uh, we want that salad to be crisp. We want that milk never to go off or to cause us any, you know, poisoning or anything like that in stereo. Um, you know, we've got all these very, very high standards now. So all our food, you know, I mean, something like M&S, most of the food's been lasered to get rid of the bacteria. It's been lasered? Yeah, they basically do a sort of um, ultraviolet treatment on the food. That's why the mango is still perfect five days later. Oh my goodness, I never even knew this. Okay. Oh. Only food, you know, you know when you go to hospitals and there's an M&S always as you go to hospitals. And the reason is because it's the only food Sorry, that is sterile enough to go into the, um, into the sort of high dependency units. Wow. Because the food has been zapped. So our food is zapped, um, you know, our households were zapping too much, you know, even more recently. Um, we're relying a lot on Calpol um, and actually the NICE guidelines. And this is not being me being weird and sort of he healy wheely hippie. This is the NICE guidelines, which are basically the government guidelines in the UK, are that ibuprofen and um, paracetamol should only be given if a child is in distress or in pain. It is not meant to be for bringing just down little fevers. So people are just fixated on bringing down a fever, but actually sometimes the child's fine. You know, they're sort of pootling around. They might not be ready to go. They might not be happy enough or well enough to go to school or nursery, but they're fine in themselves. Then, then there's no particular reason to give those. Um, but when I, you know, but if a child was obviously in obvious pain or obvious distress, then that's when to give it. So I think it's often given too much. Um, and then antibiotics are also given too much. Now, the doctors are really on this now. And actually, they're much less likely to give out antibiotics these days than they were a few years ago. 
and that's because they're very worried about antibiotic resistance. Mm. So um, that means, you know, there are a couple of superbugs going around like MRSA and C. difficile, which everyone's quite scared of. And they are, they, antibiotics, no antibiotics will kill those, or, ve- or maybe one, they, you know, like get to the end and eventually find one that does, but it's really hard to find that one that's going to zap it. And they're really, really worried this is going to happen to, our, you know, just normal infections. Um, because um, animals are fed a lot with antibiotics too. So it's in our food chain. So there's a lot of antibiotics being used in our meat, but also in, um, you know, in the way that, um, you know, we, we, we parent our children, you know, we get, they get sick, we take them to the doctor, we put them on antibiotics. And sometimes, of course, they're life-saving, important. I mean, gosh, you know, I think that I've, I've got um, one child who's never taken any, one who's taken one set and one who had to take quite a lot because she got bitten by a tick. But that's the only reason why um, we've actually had to give them in the past. So that's why I learned about nutrition. I learned about naturopathy. I learned about all the things that you can do, like Epsom salt bars and vitamin C and elderberries and these things, so that I didn't have to get into that position of you know, them getting sicker. Um, what else? Um, and then good food, you know, then where all this comes into is, is, is buying good food. So I know we can't all afford organic, et cetera, but you know, going to local farmers markets, um, trying to find, you know, the best quality food you can. Some of the budget supermarkets are now stocking some organic goods so that, that aren't too expensive. So you're doing your best. Um, but I just try and say, if you, know, if you can't get organic, try and shop local as much as as possible rather than getting food from overseas. And I know that's not always possible. You know, if your child will only eat strawberries and that's the only fruit they'll eat, then you are going to have to find a strawberry in January that probably was (laughs) grown in Morocco or whatever. But just wash them, you know, just wash them really well. And that would be better than doing nothing at all. Amazing. And if you're sort of listening to this and thinking, oh my gosh, how do I know if my child... It, you know has got any of these things what what would you recommend or what do we look for to know whether to re- get support and get help on this so I guess if your child is really thriving you think great you know they're happy they eat well they sleep well most of the time they're in a good mood they poop okay you know life's pretty good you're doing a really good job so you know they've either genetically been born with fantastic disposition that's been able to cope with all of this um or um you know you've just done a brilliant job so most of the time kids are really thriving and actually you only need to help them a little bit sometimes you know gosh they all go to they all pick up colds when they first go to nursery for instance you know if a bug's going around school it's pretty rare people get it don't get it but i think the difference is that some people fight it off more than the others so if you can be in that camp rather than the one where it lasts for two weeks that'd be great because then you can get back to work and you know, you don't have your child feeling ill for that long and getting run down. So I'm into the camp of trying to, you know, do as much as I can for them day to day, but then also just jumping in when they are a bit run down, just to try and sort of stop anything getting out of control, I guess, escalating. With like Um, natural foods and things. Yeah, exactly. So there was a a really nasty bug going around um, my youngest son's school a few years ago. Um, And in fact, one of the girls ended up with sepsis and ended up in a coma. Oh, my goodness. It was pretty traumatic. Um, Anyway, so um, they didn't shut down the school. A lot of kids got this bug and they were off for about two weeks, but no one got as sick as her. So anyway, I thought I'd sort of got through this somehow. And I went to pick him up on the Wednesday and he looked completely sheet white. And just I thought, here we go um anyway got him home and I literally gave him a a juice I just made a juice of carrot lemon ginger apple probably whatever I had in the in the fridge and I gave him a whole load of elderberry and he went straight to bed and he woke up in the morning saying I'm fine now mummy can I go to school please wow (laughs) I better keep you at home today just in case but you know he was the most annoying child in the whole world the next day because of course he was fine Um, (laughs) But I don't know whether he had the same bug as everybody else, but I suspect so because everyone else has been so sick. So it's that wow. sort of thing. It's like, you know, I worked, worked so hard when they were little. And people say, say to me, you know, gosh, you've got this amazing practice. You've got so many practitioners. You've written these books. Have you done it? 
And it's because my kids have really, honestly, I think I can count less than a handful of t days they've had off school and all. And I'm, you know, as I said, well, this is 20. So, you know, it's, wow. it's, you know, if you can do, you know, it just makes it such a difference to your life. You have so much more time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm sending my child to school. <laughs> no, that's amazing. And other than you adopting me and everyone else, how can people find you and learn from you and get your books and get all of these amazing recipes that you spoke about other than, so you've got, you've got two books, right? Or yeah. So the first book was published a couple of years ago and it's called The Good Stuff. And I guess it's 18 months to 18 um, and, you know, 120 recipes um, and lots and lots of nutritional tips at the front. So the 60 pages of everything you need to know about sugar fatty acids protein you know, iron etc and then my new one which is as I said is coming out this week um is called i can't believe it's baby food and again it's for the whole family but you can start at six months fantastic and again 120 recipes and then you can go on to so our my website is naturedoc.co.uk and then if you think hey there's no way I'm going to be able to change the diet yet, but I would quite like some supplements. Um, we have an online shop called Nature Doc Shop, um, which has a hand-picked collection of different children's vitamins and all the things that they need. And for all age groups, really, but mainly focused in on family nutrition. Um, and if, they, if, if you send us an email, I can, so, you know, with some names and so ages and sort of, you know, what the situation is, I can help or one of my team can help to guide you to the right supplements to take to. Fantastic. And you're on Instagram as well. I'm on Instagram, nature.kids. Nature.kids. Okay. Amazing. I will put all of these details in the notes as well. Thank you mm -hmm. so much. This has been an absolutely amazing chat and thank you so much for coming on here and sharing your pearls of wisdom. Jodie, it's been absolutely lovely and I hope that we meet one day in person. We will. We will. Bye. Soon. <laughs> See you later.